In this series of videos, we're gonna start talking about learning, motivation, and emotion. So learning is really uh, the most important thing that happens in the brain because you know we have these huge networks of neurons, billions of neurons interconnected by these synapses. And there's really no way to get those neurons all wired up and doing the right thing without having a very powerful learning mechanism to set essentially all those synaptic strengths to get the neurons to do the detection jobs that they need to do to compress all that sensory input coming in and extract the relevant information from the sensory input. So everything we've been talking about in terms of compression and contrast and control, all of that depends on learning. And fundamentally, learning is driven by motivation. So what you learn about, what you pay attention to, what you focus on, all of those things drive what gets learned. So learning is a function of the activity of the neurons in the brain. And that activity depends on, you know, what, what, what do you engage with? What are you, what are you activating those neurons with? So uh, we have to understand motivation to understand learning. And then fundamentally, motivation is also driven by emotion. So what are you feeling? What are those basic reactions that you have to the environment, those mood states that you have going on in your brain? All of those things de determine what uh, and, and modulate your motivational states. One of the most exciting new developments in learning is leveraging insights from these deep AI neural network models that uh, are showing up everywhere and are an incredible focus of research right now. And we can learn a lot actually about how the brain works by understanding what makes these models work and not work. So we'll talk about that as well. Let's start at the beginning and look at how synapses actually change. And this is the core of learning. Learning is about changes in synaptic strength that again is what determines what neurons detect and therefore everything else that happens in the processing hierarchy. This is classic results uh, going back to Bliss and Lomo in the 1970s, showing that if you blast neurons in the hippocampus, that you get a long lasting change in synaptic strength. And this was called long-term potentiation. So at this point here, you notice the time scale here is hours. They blasted these, uh, this little circuit in a dish. It's kind of taking the brains up and putting it on a dish. Um, and they blasted this little piece of uh, neural tissue with uh, a, a burst of a lot of electrical activity uh, called tetanic stimulation. And then whereas before they could kind of get this amount of excitation out of a, a test pulse, now they got like 50% stronger excitation out of that same test pulse. So the synapses in this circuit had been strengthened by about 50%. So what would change in the synapse? If we just think logically, here's our diagram for what goes on in the synapse, what, what could possibly change? What would be the thing that drives synaptic plasticity, that change in synaptic strength? Well, to cut a long story short, many, many years of research uh, lots of amazing uh, uh, techniques, basically a lot of stuff changes. But the main thing that changes is the number of AMPA receptors that show up here in this postsynaptic density uh, at, the, at the spine surface here. So if you have more AMPA receptors than uh, for a given amount of neurotransmitter release, you're gonna get more sodium ions, excitatory sodium ions coming into the cell. And so that cell is gonna get more excited for a given kind of action potential neurotransmitter release down here. And that's the main thing that changes. And there's a whole cascade of uh, processes that we know that involve calcium entering through these NMDA channels and uh, a series of chemical reactions involving phosphorylation and dephosphorylation and phosphatases and kinases and all kinds of fancy chemical processes um, triggered by that calcium with the net result that the AMPA receptors are modulated by that. So they're the number of AMPA receptors sticking out in this postsynaptic density 
changes dynamically. And that might seem strange when you look at these kind of diagrams, but it's really important to recognize that these things are really kind of jelly-like, very pliable, flexible things. And so you can just kind of plop and insert these little protein uh, channels sticking out here pretty easily into that uh, in and out of the membrane. And there's a whole set of processes that do that. And there's further processes involved in kind of stabilizing uh, those receptors once they're out there. Uh, and this involves these muscle fibers, but you know, so it's just an incredible story uh, of all these chemical events taking place that give rise to these synaptic changes. One of the most important things we can think about for this system is what causes the changes. So there's lots of details about how the change takes place, but one of the most important things to understand kind of about learning is what's triggering these changes in the first place. And the key result here is that it's the activity of both sides of the synapse. So the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron both have to be active. And there's a really interesting chemical and, and kind of electrical process by which that takes place. This is more detail than you need to know really at the introductory level, but I'm just gonna tell it to you so you have the full picture in case you're curious. The uh, postsynaptic cell has to be excited. This is step one here. So that the in, uh, increased membrane potential in this postsynaptic side tends to repel the positively charged magnesium ions, which are otherwise blocking the openings of these NMDA channels. So step one, postsynaptic side has to be excited. Step two, the presynaptic side has to get activated, okay? Uh, and so that's here in this diagram, step three, presynaptic neuron fires, and then you have a uh, binding of the neurotransmitter to the NMDA channels in addition to the AMPA channels. And in that same way, they kind of twist open. And this time in the NMDA case, they allow calcium to enter the cell. And that calcium uh, depends then on both pre and postsynaptic activity. And then it comes in, activates these chemical processes, which then end up resulting in a change in the uh, number of AMPA receptors there. And then these other pathways, the voltage-gated calcium channels also are a source of calcium. And it turns out that these metabotropic glutamate receptors also play a role. Uh, they don't allow ions in, but they change the metabolic processes in the postsynaptic side and enter into the way that learning works. That's the full story. The summary is essentially that this prediction from a, a Canadian psychologist named Donald Hebb, uh, which he made in 1949, uh, came true as we saw in that detailed biology. It produces this essentially Hebbian form of learning. And the, the, the punchline here is, that cells that fire together, wire together. And so going back to that diagram, as I emphasized, you have to get the postsynaptic side and the presynaptic side active in order for the uh, change in the synapse to take place. And so that's really the essential aspect of Hebbian learning. Um, we call this also associative learning because it's basically like, if you have these two neurons active, you wanna strengthen the association between them as an important additional element to the story, which is which way does that synaptic strength actually go? And initially, everybody just thought in terms of strengthening synapses, and that's kind of the Hebbian notion that you increase that strength of association between those active neurons. But if you think about it, if you just keep increasing the strength of the connections among all your neurons, you're just going to get more and more in it strongly interconnected neurons, eventually your brain's just going to kind of explode in a huge wave of activity. Um, so you need very much to have the opposite direction of those synaptic weight changes. And so when we talk about the, the original Bliss and Lomo LTP results, that's actually what occurs when you have a high level of intracellular calcium, that this is kind of the official notation for saying the intracellular concentration of calcium. And so if you have a high level of calcium, you get an, an LTP, a long-term potentiation of the synaptic strength. However, if you only have a medium level of calcium, kind of, so on the x-axis here, you're at this kind of moderate level, 
um, you turn out to get this uh, LTD, the opposite direction of synaptic weight change, long-term depression. And this, again, is equally, if not more important for how learning works um, relative to long-term potentiation. The, the dynamic here is essentially another kind of tug of war process between chemically phosphorylation and dephosphorylation processes that are kind of battling it out in that uh, postsynaptic side here. So there's a big battle taking place here um, between two processes, one which, wanna in, which wants to increase the strength and the other which wants to decrease the strength. Um, so again, we have this kind of opponent process dynamic that we've seen so many times. And this was all very theoretical in the 80s, proposed by people like John Lissman and Gary Lynch. And uh, amazingly, all this stuff has been uh, uh, proven true uh, through further experimentation. So we really understand these details in amazing detail.